Welcome back, viewers. And so today, the topic we are discussing is living African in the diaspora. Now, it particularly interests me because I have found myself in, in that situation very briefly, you know, and, and it comes with a lot of unexpected dimensions and, and you're never really ready for, for, for the experience. And so I've always wondered about those whose lives it is, you know, those who live African in the diaspora. And today we are going to discuss that topic. I have two ladies, one lives in the UK, one lives in the US, who have lived, you know, most of their lives, perhaps all of their lives, you know, abroad and who are living in abroad. By living, I mean that they've made a career for themselves there and they live life to the full as British and as American, but at the same time also as Ghanaian, as African. And I find that very intriguing. Ladies, welcome to the couch. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, I want you to introduce yourself. Let's start with the Okay, so I'm Fia Adom, and I am a journalist back in the, the UK, in London. I work for AVN Television and Radio. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> and I am Yao Boysen. I am an education consultant, reformer. Essentially, I help principals and teachers learn how to help students learn better. Wow. So let, let's take it from the top. Mm -hmm. And by the top, I'm going right to the issue of identity. Do you consider yourselves African or black? See, I think we, we had a chat about this, didn't we? <laughs> and I think um, being British and being American, it's two completely different things. So yeah, you have African-American, that's the term for generally anybody yeah. who's, who's black in the US. But in the UK, we don't have that. You know, you're British, you can be black British, or you're Ghanaian or you're Nigerian or you're Sierra Leonean we don't have this kind of blanket term so I would see myself as African mm. um, I, no I would see myself as Ghanaian I think the, the use of the, the term African for me is too broad because it's that whole we've forgotten that Africa is a continent and it's it's a continent it's not a country you know so the blanket term African doesn't really work for me um, we use the term Afropolitan back in the UK a lot. That's my radio station's tagline. And, you know, that kind of encompasses someone who um, feels that they are part of our diaspora, that they feel akin to a country in Africa, but yet have that kind of international feel to them. Mm. Um, so I think myself, I would probably use neither of those. And I would say <laughs> that I was Ghanaian. And I would also probably say that I was Scottish because I was brought up in Scotland, even though I now live in London. Um, so I would say that I was Ghanaian and Scottish rather than Scottish. African black or British, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think that's really interesting. And you hit on a couple of points that I totally agree with, mm -hmm. right? I, to simplify for people, I might tell them, tell them that I'm African, mm -hmm. but if they were to probe further, yeah. I would say to them that I'm Ghanaian mm -hmm. because we are different yeah. across, right? Across the continent, we're all very different. Mm -hmm. And so I pride myself on identifying my actual country yeah. because I'm proud of the fact that I'm a Ghanaian and I want to be known as a Ghanaian. Mm -hmm. And I think like when I'm here or talking to other Africans, it's much easier to say that. I think when I'm in the States, the states, there's so many nuances in yeah, who yeah. you are and race, right? And for me, it's always been a challenge trying to accurately define myself, right? Because I was born here in Ghana, I moved to the states at the age of six, mm -hmm. and I grew up there. But I grew up there with Ghanaian parents, mm -hmm. right? And I was raised like a Ghanaian mm -hmm. child. So a lot of who I am is very Ghanaian. Mm -hmm. But then there are moments where when I engage with family that have lived in Ghana their whole life, I all of a sudden come very close to this fact that I'm also very American, mm -hmm. right? And so in that way, I find myself saying that I'm African American mm -hmm. and in its truest sense, mm -hmm. right? Because I am African, mm -hmm. but I can't deny that America has layered on a lot of things mm -hmm. into who I am. That, that's, it's interesting you, you brought up this issue of you know, when you actually left Ghana for, mm -hmm. for, for the US. I want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. you know, once you get there as an African child, six year old, I don't know how far your memory <laughs> My your memory, memory goes pretty far. Great, <laughs> great. That's exactly what I need. So I'm going to rely on that memory. I want to understand, you know, as, as an African child who has you know, suddenly found herself in the US and is having to go up in this new 
you know it's it's, it's a new everything it's not mm. just a new country it's the culture everything is new mm. how how is the experience and you did you at any point feel like an outsider if I, the same question applies to you mm. too did you feel like an outsider at any point yeah i feel like i felt like an outsider for a long time i think thinking right now I can't think of the moment that I transitioned from an outsider into feeling that I was a part. And so I just remember like the first time seeing snow and like staring out my bedroom window and just thinking like, what is this, right? <laughs> or my favorite memory is when my parents tried to get me to eat pizza, right? Because there are certain things that are known as like standard American things, mm. right? Eating pizza, loving apple pie, mm. loving a hamburger, right? And so Macaroni my family, cheese. right, grilled, oh, I hate grilled, oh, I I hate grilled <laughs> cheese. I enjoy it. <laughs> well, this is the I thing, do. you have to have the right kind of cheese that you love, it's and, true. right? It's true. You can't, yeah. I hate cheddar, no, but just you get any, me oh. some smoked Gouda, <laughs> some smoked Gouda, no, that's true. some Havarti dill, mm. like the right cheese will turn your grilled Whole cheese around. life it's around. True. With a little tomato, okay. but yeah. <laughs> but there were these things that you know my parents felt were like American, and to assist me in assimilating, I was being brought into all of these experiences. And at that time, they were awful, right? I felt like I was just being pressured mm -hmm. into becoming something that I couldn't understand. You know, and I remember the first time eating pizza. My parents were so excited to order this pizza for me. And I was totally disgusted by it because I'd never known the concept of cheese. So I snuck upstairs and flushed it down the toilet, right? Because I didn't want to like upset them because they were so excited when I was totally grossed out. So I flushed it out the toilet. But it was just really weird. Like the first time I went to school, my family calls me a Sansua, but nobody could pronounce it. Mm. So eventually I asked them to just call me Ya because I just could not take people pronouncing my name wrong, wrong. right? Mm -hmm. But Asanta is what I love, is what my family calls me. But there are just certain things that, you know, you either stick to them or adjust them and assimilate as best mm -hmm. as you can. But definitely felt like an outsider for a while. And, you know, like, and at that time, it, you felt like, I felt like an outsider because I also was growing up in a suburb that was predominantly white and predominantly wealthy. Mm. And so not just being black, but being African in that environment also mm. added a different layer to it, right? So going to school and, you know, if you're like, you know, as kids like joke with each other, right? Like the predominant insult was you're an African booty scratcher, <laughs> right? Like that was the thing. And so like, yeah, in the early years, it really didn't feel good mm -hmm. because people weren't accepting, they couldn't understand who I was, and I was very different. And we were the only black family like for three, four, or five blocks, mm -hmm. right? And so you end up totally feeling like an outsider for a while. Mm -hmm. wow. yeah. It's what same experience? No, it's slightly different because I was born in the UK. Um, I was born in Scotland. And um, S Scotland as part of the UK is very friendly. So everybody, um, I can't really pinpoint apart from once ever feeling like someone was being racist towards me mm. um we grew up like you we were the only black family in a predominantly wealthy area and it's not even predominantly white it just was white and we weren't the only <laughs> black family for three or four blocks we were the only black family for three or four miles oh wow yeah. possibly more i'm still the only black girl that's ever gone to my school there's a big picture of me in the hallway Whoa. it's really strange yeah and that's how white is. It's, quite, it's a complete whitewash. But people were ignorant rather than racist. They were friendly, but they wanted to touch your hair and figure out where you were mm -hmm. from and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think growing up, um, my mum and dad really kept, apart from the language thing, which we'll come to, yeah. but they really kept um, us in tune of or in tune to who we were and where we were from. We always, you know, we kept our names despite people not being able to pronounce them. We just worked with it. You know, we went to Ghana practically every year or every two years. You know, we had things in the house. We were taught about our history. So we knew where we were from. But being born in the UK, that's kind of all we knew. And I guess it wasn't until I moved to London to go to university is when I really realized how different or how offbeat or off-key my growing up experience had been 
Um, not for me because I you know loved growing up in Scotland and I still go back but moving to London and seeing so many meeting so many Ghanaian people who are British born Nigerian people who are British born I mean I remember going to um, getting on the train to go from Glasgow to London with my mum to go and look at the university I wanted to go to it's like a 500 mile journey and it was six <laughs> hours on the train and we got off the train and there was black people everywhere and I was like Okay, so if I hold on, you actually experienced shock. Yeah, because I wasn't a lot in Ghana, but there was black people everywhere. But I wasn't in Ghana. So okay, I was so like, this brings me where to did my they next come from? issue. Let's talk about integration. Mm. Let's talk about integration. How how are you able or how? See, I'm struggling between making it a past and a present tense. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think mm -hmm. you can understand why. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so how, how are you able to integrate, first of all, with other black people? You could narrow it down to Ghanaians and then take it up to other black people. And then let's I talk about all the other nationals that exist in the UK and the US, which is every, every other national. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. in, in, in Scotland, it's harder just because there's literally less of them. So less black people end up there for what for whatever reason. You know, London's the UK's capital. Everybody will go there for work or whatever. I think, and it's, it's. I personally found it initially strange, although, but eventually quite easy to integrate with other black people because you, when you're in a university situation, everybody's thrown together in dorms. You meet people from everywhere and everyone's in that same boat of, I don't know you, I'm here to study, let's be friends. I don't know you, let's be friends. So you do it in that way. And then in your working life, you know, you'll come across people and you make your networks and you make your connections that way. I mean, I work in a company that's Ghanaian owned. And I think every single, apart from one person on the staff is Ghanaian. Mm. And so it's, you know, it's diaspora and heavy and we speak to you in the office and, you know, we have a bank wine for lunch and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and it's, it, I love it and it's amazing. You feel like you're home. But sometimes I think to myself, am I not stepping out of my comfort zone enough? And I've worked in a whole, a whole raft of companies. You know, I've worked in small television production companies. I've worked at the BBC, I've worked at ITV. I've been the only black woman on staff. I've been the only black person on staff. I've been the only woman on staff, you know? But, you, I think it's just where life takes you. You always, you always will make that integration. Of course, mm. when you run into another Ghanaian person, you're immediately friends. You know, you are. The, the, the reason why I bring up this integration issue, for, or perhaps the reason why the, the issue of integration is interesting, you know, particularly for me, is because as African students, when we find ourselves in wherever, mm -hmm. UK, US, we mm -hmm. tend to gravitate towards each other. Yeah and stay in that circle. Yeah. So I have a lot of friends, or I had a lot of friends say to me, what do you talk about with them? And this is them being maybe somebody from Canada mm. or somebody from Italy. Because mm. for whatever reason, I cannot explain it. I'm that black girl who had other friends. I was the same. You, you understand what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, so, yeah. But then the truth is that we tend to stick together mm. and completely have the same experience perhaps we had in Ghana. I would make my fufu every day mm -hmm. and eat. You know, I'll, in the evening I'll cook my jollof and eat. I, you won't find me in a typical British restaurant or a typical British pub or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so you probably have somebody who has lived in the UK for up to 20 years mm -hmm. and has not really lived in the UK. Mm. Let's go to Seven Sisters. Yeah. You find people ask them for salt on the street. But you mean, 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 mean. Mm. The first time I saw that, I was shocked. It's like practically walking in Kumasi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is London. And so is this, this an area here. that's predominantly like Ghanaian? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And there's Not another even one. black, Ghanaian. Yeah, Ghanaian. Dalston. Dalston, oh. which is near where I live. Where, honestly, it, there's a section of the market in Dalston Market where you won't hear English spoken. I don't think that is a symptom of being Ghanaian. I think it's a symptom of being an immigrant. And the reason I say that is because in the United States, right, we're a melting pot and there are lots of different nationalities that exist. Do you but, really believe the United States is a melting pot? Um, I, I think in what the term was meant to be, not necessarily, mm. but for mm. now and for the conversation, right? Mm. Yes. And so regardless of the state, that you're in, you can always find an immigrant population mm. that has grouped themselves together. Yeah. So in the Bronx, 
right, there is Little Italy. And when you go to Little Italy, it's nothing but Italian restaurants, Italian people. Mm -hmm. When you go downtown to Manhattan, Chinatown. there's Chinatown. Mm -hmm. It's a symptom to me, I see it as a symptom of being an immigrant, and you need to find that comfort. Just, just based on being a human, mm -hmm. you need to have a place of comfort. And so I find that like, when you're <coughs> in a space where it is not your natural space, you do seek that comfort, right? And, and something you do gravitate towards each yeah. other. Yeah. One thing that I think is interesting because I went to a historically black university, right? I went to Howard University mm -hmm. and which is totally all black, right? At the time I went, we had like, I don't know, one percent other, mm -hmm. which amounted to maybe three, four people and wow. everybody knew who they were on <laughs> campus, right? I mean just the natural fact. My high school was different. At my high school, there was any and every nationality you can find, which is why I chose to go to a black school, right? Because I was like, I totally get this. I get you, I get you, I get you, I've grown up with you. I really wanna understand what it means to be like black. And I wanna go to a black school where they're about my success, right? Because being black in America is very different. Mm -hmm. and it really, really is different. There are a lot of layers and nuances that you always have to think about in your general daily interactions, right? And so going to Howard really opened my eyes to the variation of blackness that exists. And it was a beautiful variation, right? Sometimes funny variation because I, I knew who was from who was black and from Texas and I could tell who was black and from California mm. much like they could tell that I was black and from New York right mm. and just watching that nuance was interesting the other thing is that the African students on campus even in the scope of being in an all-black campus still gravitated towards each other and yeah. created that group and that circle that you could not penetrate unless you were African. Okay, so now let's just, you know, briefly before <coughs> we go on, an, on our next break, because mm. we have a, a break very shortly, I want us to look at this issue of integration and look at it in terms of how useful is it to, to you? Is it, is it something that should be encouraged? Is it something that should be discouraged? For instance, should we keep on having these black societies in, 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 in universities? I should we have the Nigerian society? The Ghanaian society? I think you need a good enough balance of both. Yep. I think it's great to have um, the African society and the black student society and the Nigerian society, but also it's good to have the international student society. So for everyone who's come from somewhere else to that university to to, to have their own club, I think you need, you need elements of that because it's especially if you're an international student you're so far from home yep. you're so far from what you know and what you've been brought up with that you need that to be able to continue at an, an equilibrium i think psychologically you have to be able to um know where you're from and still have that maintained in your life by pounding your fufu by e yep. eating prawn crackers or whatever it is that you mm. do where you're from you need that because to remove that part of you just like that, you won't be able to function as a human being. So I think you need that. But I also think that whatever country you've decided to move to, be it the US, the UK, or Greece, or Cyprus, or Slovenia, you must also be able to understand that country that you're from and integrate with those people that live there. And I think to feel that you shouldn't have to do that, or feel that you won't do that, is an arrogance, and it shouldn't, you shouldn't take that on. Or, it sounds horrible, don't go there in the first place. You know, if you're not willing to integrate with the people in the country that you live in, why, why go there? You just go there to take advantage of what they have, reap it and go back home. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be that way, you know? And then that sort of, that negates away from this melting pot that we've all tried to create from globalization and all these things, and takes it more to the salad bowl, and it's, what's the point? You know, if you if you never wanted to integrate with the people of the country you went to, don't go there in the first place. Mm. I yeah. think I think it's interesting because I agree with some of her points, and but the point about arrogance, I think, is what I've been sitting here meditating on, mm. and I'm hesitant to call it arrogance. Mm. And I what think do you call that it? I don't know if I want to call it anything. Mm. And I think what I'm really thinking about in the state, your identity is critically important. Right? It's critically important because that is how people view you. That is the first lens. Mm. Before people even try to process you as an individual, they want to understand what state are you from? Yeah. Why do you sound different from me? Right. So I grew up in New York, but I live in D.C. 
but continuously, <coughs> even when I was a teacher, right, as soon as I speak, where are you from, right, because they can, well, I used to have a much thicker New York accent than I do that now. this one. Yeah, <laughs> it used to be much thicker. Like, I consistently got the question, are you from Brooklyn? But because I've been in D.C. for a while, it's like mellowing out. But you have to really hold on to who you are. And I think about myself and the fact that my parents sent me there to get an education, right? Mm. I wasn't necessarily sent there to, like, integrate and join this culture. I was sent there purposefully to get an education mm. and to return. And I agree in some ways it's, like, right, um, very parasitic in a way, yeah, right? <laughs> right. But mm. don't get me into that discussion. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, a whole. Okay, no, that's a whole. That okay, yeah. Yeah. I know, right? Let's right? stay on board. <laughs> and I get that. But I also think there's a symbiosis that exists in that because we go there and mm. we also add to their culture. Whether we decide yeah. to integrate yeah. there or not, exactly. there are lots of things that we bring to that whatever place we go to. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, I don't want to call it arrogance, right? And I think it's somebody that I get to like watch so many groups of people. And as an education reformer, I go into neighborhoods that are predominantly black and predominantly poor. Most education reformers are white, mm. right? I, I work for an alternative certification program. Most of the people that come in that we train do not look like the students they're going to teach. Mm. And so in that way, and particularly now as an organization, we're really thinking about how our teachers and principals step into these buildings. Mm -hmm. Because in anything, I agree with you, you have to understand who you're dealing with mm -hmm. and working with, right? And so yes, in some way you have to have balance and learn where you are. Mm -hmm. But I think it's okay if you don't fully integrate. Like, know enough to get along, to get, get by, by mm -hmm. but you don't have to fully take on this culture. And I no, find I that mean, it runs okay, the like, yes. Hold on, hold on. I want us to take a quick commercial break. And I want us to just pick it up from where you left off. Mm -hmm. By that, I want us to talk about the your identity as African. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about language. Let's talk about hair. Let's talk about mm. what you wear. Let's talk about your tattoos, ladies. <laughs> so we'll take a quick commercial break. When we come back, we are still talking to Ifwa and Asansua. Uh. <laughs> <laughs>